Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Diane Nolan and I'm here to be the host and talk about questions that are happening right now in the gardening, in, in the garden and with gardening. I am a teacher at the University of Illinois, not in the summer. And so my area is in cut flowers and uh, perennials. And so if they have, if you have questions for those, I will take care of that. But I have three really highly intelligent folks next to me and they're here to answer your questions too. So let's find out who they are and what their expertise is. And I think they're gonna do some show and tell as well. Let's start first with you, Ella Maxwell. Hi, I work at Hare Nursery in Peoria and um, I'm a horticulturist there and my expertise is uh, trees, shrubs, but I did bring, I love hostas. So I want our viewers to know what you can do with uh, growing hostas from seeds. So I brought some leaves. You can see the large diversity and the different colors and sizes, texture. There's about 6,000 different registered hostas now, but they've started to bloom and they'll be setting seed. And this is a, a example of the seed pod with a beautiful hydrangea behind it. But um, once this seed uh, pod here turns a little bit dry, which with this early flowering ones will be within, um, within a month, you can actually open the seed pods, and I don't think we can really see it, but the seeds are black. And I've brought some seed here in a bag, and it's viable right away. There's no dormancy, and I like to make it a uh, fall or even a winter project with a small, um, this is just a little plastic tub. I've, I've put some holes with a fork here at, for drainage, but you can just self-seed on the top, and then most of the hostas that you're going to get will be green. Um, it's very difficult to get a variegated hosta, but you can get the yellows or the blues, and they're all interesting, and you want to plant them and save them all. So now's the time to think about saving some hosta seeds. A lot of people cut all the scape. That's what this is, the flower scape off. And um, I want to say, hey, save some for seed and grow it this winter. Ella, that is a great idea. You should be a teacher. Okay. Full time. <laughs> but you are a teacher at your work and here on the show. That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. That's a good idea. Okay, I'm going to move over to you, Dave Plissard. Hi, I'm Dave Plissard from the Garden Center at Hare Nursery. And I am specialty in landscaping and trees. I'm a certified arborist. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is hydrangea and uh, this sample of hydrangea that I have is called Invincible Spirit 2. And the reason I'm bringing it is that it is um, a form of what we traditionally see as a, the white hydrangeas. They're flowering now with the big white balls on them and they have developed some now that are pink. This is not the same as the ones that can be either pink or blue. This is a different variety of the white ones, only it's been developed as pink. Uh, it originally started at, I think it was um, North Carolina University. But this is second generation of this particular plant. And it's so beautiful, it comes out, this top flower is a deeper pink, and then it changes to a lighter pink as it, the flower matures. And you can see how big they get. They're, it's really new and interesting. And so I thought this would be a good introduction for you to realize that for those of you that like the pink hydrangeas but maybe have trouble with uh, big leaf varieties, the, the smooth hydrangeas can come in pink too and they're coming out with new varieties and there's several different ones available now but this is Invincible Spirit too. And is it uh, related to the Annabelles? It is related to the Annabelles. Sounds like and it is. Annabelle is a smooth hydrangea as well, which was selected by J.C. McDaniels here at the University, University of Illinois. Illinois. So, yeah, so that's pretty cool that um, I just professor, happened to drop that name yes, in there. Yes, you know, had to. Yeah. Uh, professor McDaniels, uh, year, the last year he worked before he retired was my first year oh, is that at right? the University of Illinois. So. Good. I remember how interesting he was and uh, had lots of things going on. He had many projects. He was mm -hmm. an interesting person. Thank you very much. That's a pretty sure. color. I like it at both stages. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Sure. And now 
To you, Karen Ruckel. Hi. I also work at Hair Nursery in Peoria and uh, work with trees, shrubs, perennials. And um, what I brought for my show and share is uh, some pictures from my yard. And we talk a lot in this gardening program about soil, site, watering. And I think the most important thing we need in gardening is optimism. And so what I'm showing right now is, is having to be optimistic. This is my sweet summer loved by Japanese beetles, Clematis. Oh. And a lot of people have trouble with Clematis wilt in your yard, and that's a, a disease that affects the Clematis. And so I thought, oh, well, they say using the small flowered Clematis, something like the Sweet Autumn flowering Clematis works. But I thought, oh, I'll try this new variety with this cranberry violet blooms. And just as it finally this year came into full bloom that morning the Japanese beetles was a pretty big emergence in my yard and all the blooms are gone so oh. I don't know what this really looks like when it's pretty <laughs> because all of my blooms are gone I thought it was a new variety with just the spiky flora <laughs> so that was that optimistic yeah yeah and and last year it started to bloom I sent a picture to Ella and I thought oh this is gonna be so great this year and and the beetles ate it all Wow and then my next optimistic plant is my endless disappointment hydrangea <laughs> this is my hydrangea this year and it has two blooms you can't see it because they're covered up by the growth and it's been planted nine years so in 2013 on the next image is what it looked like in 2013. I lost track of the number of blooms on that plant. So I just I just wanted to talk about, you know, being optimistic and hoping and believing that good things will happen in the future. Now, what's the actual name of that plant for <laughs> our viewers? That is Endless Summer Hydrangea. And, and, um, and, and you know, Dave Robson calls it endless bummer. <laughs> <laughs> endless disappointment. <laughs> was, okay, I was trying not to laugh. <laughs> I was trying not to guffaw, actually. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that on air. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. That, that's good to have optimism, yes. Karen. I'm yes. very proud of you. <laughs> well, I want to talk next about the P. Allen Smith Tour. You can join a group here from WILL in October. His gardens are fantastic, and so they're going to do a garden to table tour with Chuck Voigt, who is one of our panelists here on the show, and uh, WILL's own Heather Miller. So give them a call it, here at the station, 217 333 7300 7300. And tour group planners is doing that and it'll be a great trip we had a great time last year and it filled really fast all right let's go to our phone lines next and we have more phone lines open so if you want to give us a call let's go to bob's question and it's on ash trees on line two hi bob hi i just want to thank you for the uh information you've given me on the ash trees in the past and uh i had an arborist come out and treat them and he he thinks he's going to get them to keep them alive. Great. Well, thank you again. Very good. Good summer. Uh, Dave, say a little bit about what that arborist probably had to do to keep his ash trees alive. Well, I assume then he's talking about emerald ash borer. Yes. And uh, that is a devastating insect that has um, potential to destroy all the uh, emerald ash, or I'm sorry, all the ash in Illinois. And so they treat it. Uh, if you have an arborist who treats it, he will probably use a chemical called uh, triage that he injects into the tree. And that gives pretty much 100% control. And it does last for two years in the tree. So you do not need to, to retreat annually. You do have to retreat every other year. Uh, but you can also treat yourself with a chemical called imidacloprid. It's very easy to apply around, just pour it around the base of the tree onto direct soil and follow with some water and it will give you good protection as well uh, but it needs to be done yearly and I'm just gonna mention when you're using imidacloprid you do not want to use it on anything that is pollinated by bees butterflies etc because it it will kill them as well and we have to protect our pollinators when I've, I've been mm -hmm. shocked in the Peoria area just, just this year how quickly trees are dying, mm -hmm. how, how much already devastation you're seeing. I've been seeing it in the corridor from Peoria, Bloomington to Champaign. It's really noticeable. Mm -hmm. And you'll have growth right at the trunk and 
branches are dead. It's so it's good that Bob's got a great story to tell us, yeah. and he probably got on it quickly. So we thank you, Bob, for that and for your discussion too, Dave. Well, let's go to uh, line three, and Annette has a hosta question for us. Hi, Annette. Hi. Enjoy your program very much. Thank you. I have uh, created a new uh, bed under a tree. I used to have ground cover there, and now I have. I'm, I'm, I want to put hostas there. Now, several people have wanted to give me some. And when is the best time to transplant them or divide them and transplant them? So when is the best time and when also can she do it if she's tough? Okay, that's, I'm gonna throw well, it over to. I, I brought the hosta leaf, so I'm gonna jump in on that okay. one. But uh, the, the neat thing in that is, is that hosta can be transplanted pretty much any time of the year. Probably early in the spring is best. It's important to keep them well watered. And the other thing is that you want to dig them with like a garden fork <coughs> to avoid uh, cutting a lot of the roots. They don't make the root hairs the way that, that other fibrous uh, perennials might. But uh, she could get hostas from any of her friends uh, all, all summer into fall. And then there's just the concern about watering. Yeah. So as long as you keep it watered. Well, that was a good question. Thank you for the hosta dividing question. Let's go to Betty's question about hemlocks next. She's on line four. Hi there, Betty. Hi, I have a question. Is it possible that with this crazy weather we have here, that a, north, a northern hemlock tree would survive well, Canadian hemlock, which I assume is the one you're referring to, does very well in Illinois, so you should not have any, any trouble with it. Uh, initially, when they're planted, you do want to make sure and keep them uh, watered going into winter so that they don't uh, dry out uh, during the winter, but there are many good hemlocks around, so yes, you would have great success with it. And conditions, would it be, it can take a little bit of shade, Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah. It is a sun or shade uh, tolerant plant, and uh, the regular hemlock grows quite large. It actually is a tree, but there are also varieties that are shrub form. There's a beautiful weeping hemlock. Uh, there's uh, shrub forms like Gensch White and Jetaloa. So there's a number of varieties that can be used as a shrub form, not just a tree. Very graceful plant. Uh, does best in a, in a good soil. I probably wouldn't put it in a rocky soil, but other than that, it, um, it should do well here for people. Okay, very good. I always remember they were leading up to near the alma mater. There used to be, I, there oh. may still be a lot of hemlocks there, I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but I recall that from undergraduate days. All right, let's go to Peggy's question about hydrangeas on line five. Hello, Peggy. Hello. My first question is, does all the species of hydrangea... Is what? You, okay, can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, we can hear you fine. We just didn't catch your question. Okay. Are all species of hydrangea, if you put the acid fertilizer on it, will it turn them purple or, or blue, or is there just certain Okay, good question. Okay, so can all hydrangea be pink or blue depending on what you put on them? And the answer is no. No. Because <laughs> you'll have some, like the Annabelle, are strictly white. Yes. Oh, except we uh, have the pink. Well, the and one then, that I brought. But, right. but Annabelle uh, is white. But this one that I, that I brought, um, it is pink, but you cannot make it blue. So right. it doesn't really matter. Uh, how much acid you put on it, it's, it's going to say pink. And then there are many other varieties of hydrangea, like the oak leaf hydrangea, mm -hmm. um, that it's gonna be white flowers and they will turn uh, pinkish color as they mature. Uh, so do the panicled hydrangeas, like limelight and quick fire and those. They're all white and you cannot change the color of them by putting on acid. Okay. But the one that you can change is the big leaf macrophyllotype, 
and uh, that's the new Endless Summer mm -hmm. or a lot of different ones there and they can be treated to get blue or kind of a purple in between and it's all based on the soil uh, pH of okay. the soil. And um, aluminum. Yes. Okay. Very good. Now we're going to jump into some Japanese beetle questions. So let's go to Anne's question on line two. Hello, Anne. Good evening, and thank you for your good programming. I enjoy it so much. Thank you. And so uh, my question is, I didn't put down the bear uh, product that I always put down, the systemic. And um, because last year I didn't, well, actually last year I didn't put it down either, and I had no Japanese beetles. So I thought, oh gosh, I probably don't need to put it down. Long story less long, I've now just heard somebody talk about Japanese beetles, and I'm scared that I'm going to have them. So I'm wondering if I could treat my lawn real quickly for the, um, for the um, insects and maybe catch them before they emerge from the lawn. Karen, you you're the beetle well, queen. Well, I mean, I mean, I've heard uh, a lot of times you can control the grubs in their form in the lawn. A lot of times when they do an emergence from the lawn, um, it's very hard to catch when they're at that stage before they go start flying off and finding food sources. So, you know, certainly later this summer you can keep checking your lawn, and if your lawn ever kind of pulls up like a rug, typically that's too many grubs and you would want to treat to try to eliminate some of them that are feeding on the grass roots. Um, the other thing is, is some areas you, know, you, may, you may be okay and you might just miss it. Um, you know, I, I always have that dilemma of spray or not spray. Um, when the beetles came out, the wrens, house wrens were having two fledglings in the yard. I've got hummingbirds. Last night when they were eating away on my Japanese maple, there was a little praying mantis running around. So it's, it's thinking about the other insects mm -hmm. too um, and how much damage you can tolerate. Yes, and treating, treating the grubs will, will help your grass, but that's not really going to affect how many Japanese beetles you have in your yard because they fly in from mm -hmm. other places. And even up in the Peoria area, uh, I have only a few Japanese beetles this year, but other people have quite a number of them. So it depends on the locality and uh, a lot of it from a few years ago when we had a couple years of drought and then there weren't any Japanese beetles after that. And so they're in some places like where I live, they're slowly maybe increasing their populations, but other places they already have. And they've been here long enough that they're becoming a little bit cyclic. So uh, one year they'll be bad, another year they may not be. So mm -hmm. you never really know ahead of time what's going to happen. So treat them, uh, you can treat them on an annual basis, but again, keep in mind the chemical, uh, one of the chemicals that you use, and you were talking about soil treatment, I believe, mm -hmm. should not be used on flowering plants that are pollinated by bees, butterflies, etc. There are other chemicals to spray um, to control the adults, imidacloprid on the lawn is fine to control the grubs. So the insect has two stages, the grubs and the adult, both of which do damage, both of which feed. But, but don't you believe that the peak emergence has happened? If, if you are scouting and you're not seeing damage, you probably will not have late emergent beetles, I don't believe. Yeah, so I think, I think she's okay. Out and about. I know in my garden where I have something I really want not to have damage, I actually use the soapy water technique mm -hmm. that Phil Nixon, Dr. Nixon always talks about. And I just tap and they will do this survival mechanism where they roll up and just drop right into my soapy water. And mm -hmm. so I don't spray for them, but I will do some localized areas where they can't swim on wet water. Yeah. So yeah. that's, a, that's a very release. good t technique for for smaller plants, doesn't work for big oh, trees, but. No, no, yeah. it's just flowering things that have just come out yeah. and I want them to stay away from those and mm -hmm. they hang out on my asparagus now. And they love, you know, they do like a lot of weeds, smart weeds, mm -hmm. native grapes. Velvet leaf. 
Yes, they do like velvet leaf. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, great. Which means we have those because we know <laughs> we know about them. So thank you for that question. And it looks like uh, we have another Japanese beetle question. I'm going to go ahead and do that one. Uh, Mary, do you have a different Japanese beetle question? And you're on line six. Hi there. Mary? Hi. Yes. What's your question? Hi. I have a question. Um, shall, shall I tell this question to you? Sure. Go right ahead. You're on the air. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, um, we have a problem area inside a fence line. The problem area is about three feet wide. We'd like to eradicate all the weeds and plants that are in there and plant something that doesn't need a lot of care. For instance, the grass, some kind of grass, or um, shrubs, or other plantings. Mm -hmm. Are there any suggestions on that? Okay, so first you'd have to get rid of what is in there. Mm -hmm. so could use Roundup. Could. So you'd want to get rid of what's there first. Now, what would you folks like to suggest for a three-foot wide area? We can all have a crack at it. What would you say? I, I would put down some type of landscape fabric and maybe some rock and some uh, perennials or, or some s small, low shrubs, uh, depending on what you like, even evergreens like uh, broadleaf evergreen like boxwood. Mm -hmm. And y she could do all one thing or she could break it up and do Did she shrubs. say how long the area was? I don't recall. No. I know okay. it's three feet wide. Okay. I, I don't know that I feel grasses are low maintenance. And she mentioned grasses because grasses, it they seems like after four years, you've got to dig them and, and they've died in the center. Yeah, cut back. Oh. And so I think long term, like Ella said, a shrub um, would, would be low maintenance. But, and boxwoods would stay within that three foot. Or wood. shear mm -hmm. them to or make them yeah, But then that's not low maintenance. No, but it's but quick. It is quick. <laughs> so, but first you've got to get rid of all of that and then put your area back to whatever you would like to put and, in and there. And that's where she should visit her local nursery and get expert advice from the horticulturist. <laughs> or she could uh, have things at different seasons and see what she likes at different seasons and have, or maybe do some repeating things where it's not all one thing, but spring, summer, fall, you know, have a few different things. Oh, there's an endless amount of things. Or a big fence. No, I don't <laughs> think so. Not a big fence. All right, let's go to the Canadian Thistle question, and that's on line three. Hi there. Well, hi, hi Diane. This is Steve Friend. Oh, so, yes. So actually, uh, I will just reiterate that uh, that boxwoods are a good deal. I'm just looking out at mine right now. We don't prune them very often, and they, they look absolutely good. I like the not pruning very often method. Yep, I do too. <laughs> now, let me get to the real problem. We have a veritable invasion of Canadian thistle in our backyard. It's in some of our beds. It's gotten itself into our lawn what do we do okay Canadian thistle first off it is a noxious weed so you have yeah. to get it out of there um, I would I would use a broadleaf weed control is probably your best bet uh, most of them have a spreader sticker in them so you can use them straight from the uh, bottle and make sure that you get good coverage with them so there's at least some uh, uh, when you cover the plant, you can kind of see the water run off a little bit from it so that you know that you're getting it covered well because of the hairs that are on the plant. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a little bit hard to, to get them wet down, so you just want to make sure that you wet them pretty well. It's pretty easy in the lawn because you're not going to damage the grass at all. When you get to your bed, that is going to make it a little bit more difficult because you want to make sure uh, if you are spraying that none of the spray uh, hits any of the plants that you want to save, uh, any of the broadleaf plants. It won't hurt a grass plant, but it certainly will hurt most of your other types of shrubs. Um, some cases you may want to just dig them out, use a um, dandelion knife or asparagus knife and uh, get down there and, and cut, sever the root and then pull it out with some uh, heavy gloves and long sleeve long shirts, sleeves, yes. uh, definitely. But spray is probably an easier way if you can do it without damaging your shrubs. And in his beds, he could maybe do a cut, you know, he could cut it and put something around so anything that would drop down it, but he could, he could actually treat the cut in, don't you think? Oh, 
he could probably, yeah. yeah. You don't he think could, so? You no. don't think the cut would do no, it? No, it's cut, not, the, it's not cut it off work. and then treat the tip with uh, with Roundup? No, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. I because, because what happens is you think that that's going to be okay, but some of that, maybe with Roundup, but if you use any... Yeah, uh, I was thinking Roundup. Any, uh, I've done something like that with Tordon on hops and and it just washed and killed way more than I thought it was going to. So you need, I, I don't recommend a oh, cut so. treatment for a herbaceous type of weed, maybe a woody plant. I just did that yesterday with some Roundup. I hope my plants are okay. <laughs> well, I have done it with Roundup and they're fine, you know, I, but I haven't done it on a Canadian thistle. That's why I was asking that. But well, like you said, Canadian thistles aren't horrible to pull out. It's just this, the spines yeah. is the bad part. So. Very prickly. Yes. So, and finding out early. Okay. Well, thank you folks for being here. It was a great show. Wow. I want to thank each of you for watching. I hope you get out there and garden and have a great time while you're doing it. Bye-bye.